it's time to make this very straightforward DIY prop way more overly complicated than it should ever be. Today, I'm going to make a man-eating plant prop out of this fake pumpkin and a few other additional supplies. I just want to say this up front, but the goal of this project is to make a prop that resembles the puppet from the movie Little Shop of Horrors, but isn't a completely scaled down, one-to-one, -one accurate recreation. My goal is to make a prop that is close, but it's my own personal interpretation of the iconic puppet. Some of the changes will be due to the supplies that I have available to me, as well as the fact that I'm just quite frankly not a master craftsman like the folks that worked on the movie. With that said, I'm going to start working on the stem first. As a quick side note, when I worked on this project, I bounced around working on different elements at different times. So there might be spoilers for the final product in some shots, as well as there might be flashbacks to unfinished pieces that were previously shown to be finished earlier in the video. Basically, when I was editing, I kept to showing work that I did on one of the main pieces at a time. I started by drawing the basic shape that I wanted for the stem and cutting out three matching pieces. I then used expansion foam to glue them all together. Once the foam fully cured, I used my hot knife, my horse brush, and various grits of sandpaper to fine tune the basic shape of the stem. After making several projects like this, I've learned that there is a section of time as the expansion foam is curing that I can easily remove the bamboo skewers that I use to hold everything together. It's kind of like a Goldilocks window of time where the foam isn't still expanding, but still isn't fully cured. If I wait until the foam is fully cured, the bamboo skewers can be glued in place and can be very difficult to remove, which is actually what happened when I was working on this project. With the basic shape of the stem roughed out, I trace out the shape of the bottom of the stem onto a piece of wood and cut out a scaled down version that I can eventually embed into the foam. I then drill two recessed holes and secure down two T-nuts into the wood. Next, I glue on a couple of caps over the T-nuts so that moisture and air can't reach the styrofoam. If the foam gets exposed to moisture or air, over time it can degrade the quality of the foam. With the piece of wood ready, I trace it out onto the bottom of the stem and use my hot knife with a special blade to cut away the foam. Once the board fits properly, I use some more expansion foam to glue it into place. Next, I'm going to cut out the pieces of wood that I'll need to make the female end of the attachment point where the flower and the stem will bolt together. I trace out a template using the male end of the attachment point that is on the back of the flower. I then use that template to draw out the piece that I'll need to make the female end of the connection point. Then I carefully cut it out and clean it up with my Dremel. I also cut out a thinner piece of wood that will be the backing plate for the connection point. With all of the parts cleaned up, it's time to glue them together. With the glue dry, I can now embed it into the top of the stem. I use my special square-shaped hot knife blade to cut away the foam and use my Dremel to fine-tune the recess for it to fit into. Next, I'm going to cut out a square-shaped hole all the way through to the back of the stem. This way, I can embed a piece of 2x2 two two with a hole drilled through it into the foam. This will give me something solid that goes all the way through the stem that I can use to tighten the bolt that will hold the stem and flower together. Just like the other piece of wood, I used the expansion foam to glue it into place. With the first batch cured, I used the second batch to fill in any gaps.
Now that I have that part ready to go, I can start fine-tuning the shape of the stem. From a couple of reference photos that I found of the stem of Audrey 2, it looks like it has segments to it. To replicate that look, I draw out some seams around the stem and use a different V-shaped blade on my hot knife to score every other one. This is because I want every other segment on the stem to be a deep one, then a shallow one, then a deep one, and a shallow one, and so on. The sandpaper that I use is a combination of an angle grinder disc and a folded over 80 grit piece of sandpaper that I use on my orbital sander. The angle grinder disc is very coarse and can remove the material very quickly. The sandpaper then can smooth everything out for a more refined finish. I'm going to move on to using some epoxy sculpting putty to add some more intricate details to it. Again, from the pictures that I found, it appears that the original puppet had these curved shapes to the top of the stem, so I figured that they'd be easier to replicate with the putty instead of trying to sculpt them out of the foam. I also added these little dimples as a bit of artistic license and to put my own little spin on it. The picture that I was referencing didn't have them, but during the Mean Green Mother sequence, it's very clear in a few shots that the fully grown Audrey 2 has thorns on the stem. So I added these little extra details to give something for those thorns to be protruding out of. After letting the first batch of epoxy putty cure overnight, I mix up a second batch and add the same details on the other side of the stem. I chose to use this epoxy putty instead of clay or foam clay or some other material because once it cures, it's very durable and won't react to the hard coating that I'll be putting over it. After I finished the details on the sides of the stem, I also filled in the space around the wooden block at the top of the stem and shaped the epoxy putty so that it would blend in better with the back of the flower. After I checked the fit of how the stem meets up with the flower, I used my Dremel to make it fit just a bit better as well as I smoothed out the lumpy shape of the epoxy putty. I then ground down the wood 2x2 to match the curve of the stem, and now I'm ready to start hard coating this thing. For the hard coating for this project, I'll be using epoxy resin as well as woven fiberglass cloth. I start by brushing on some resin, and then laying small pieces of fiberglass into that resin. To make things easier, the fiberglass is cut into small pieces instead of being one big piece that covers the whole thing. This way, the smaller pieces are more easily able to form themselves to the curves and details of the stem. Additionally, the epoxy resin doesn't dissolve the foam like polyester resin does. This is why I'm able to apply the resin directly to the foam without any issues. After letting the first layer of resin sit for a couple of hours, it's now about halfway cured and rather tacky. This is the perfect time to lay on another coat of resin for two reasons. First, is that the new pieces of fiberglass will stick to the surface much better, and second, is that the new coat of resin will have a better bond with the tacky first coat. The other thing that I'm doing is that I'm laying the new pieces of fiberglass over the top of the seams of the first layer. This will ensure that there are no weak points in the hard coat. With a few more hours having passed, and a second coat of resin still a bit tacky, I brush on an additional coat of resin over the entire stem. This coat is just resin and doesn't have any bits of fiberglass cloth in it. The reason for this is that because once everything is cured, I'm going to sand everything down before I add another coat of resin. If I didn't add this additional coat of resin over top of the fiberglass cloth, I could end up unintentionally sanding through the fiberglass cloth in spots where I didn't want to. For those who don't know, fiberglass cloth is what gives resin its strength. If I sanded through it, I would be creating weak spots in the hard coat. That's why I added the additional coat of resin, so there'd be more resin to sand through before I hit the fiberglass cloth. For anyone wondering why my arms are wrapped in trash bags and Gorilla Tape, it's because back when I worked on my Lumpy the Penguin project, I used the Dremel on the fiberglass and resin, and it had a bit of an adverse side effect. After I was done using the high-speed Dremel, it felt like there was millions of little needles in my arms. It was a bit painful, a bit itchy, and definitely nerve-wracking because I didn't know if it would get worse or never go away. The bags and tape are there to protect me from that issue, and it worked out great.
With everything sanded down and all of the sharp edges from the fiberglass removed, I mix up another batch of resin and brush it over the entire stem. After allowing the resin to fully cure, I mixed up a batch of epoxy putty and filled in and smoothed out the gap between the piece of wood and the resin hard coat. With the epoxy putty fully cured, I sand down the bottom of the stem and mix up a small batch of resin. I then coat the base of the stem and let it sit for a couple of hours until the resin has become tacky to the touch. I need the resin to be tacky so that it can hold the next pieces of fiberglass cloth in place. The fiberglass cloth doesn't like going over sharp corners like these, so I need a tacky surface for it to stick to. I then coat the entire edge with two layers of cloth and allow it to fully cure. Once cured, I sand down the entire surface of the stem. To get the surface to be nice and smooth, I basically need to keep sanding everything down and doing coats of resin until I get the finish that I'm after. This process will fill in the low spots with resin as I keep sanding down the high spots. The upside to coating something with fiberglass and resin is that the end result can be very strong. The downside is it can be a bit brittle and prone to cracking or shattering. I then use a small batch of epoxy putty to fill in the low spots that I circled with a red marker. And once the putty has cured, I cover the entire stem with another batch of resin. This batch of resin will actually be the last coat of resin that I put onto the stem. With the resin fully cured, I sand everything down and get the stem prepped for paint. Sanding this thing by hand was taking forever, so I broke out the Dremel to try to speed things up. I didn't have to worry about anything getting stuck in my arms at this point, because I was just sanding the outer layers of resin that didn't contain any fiberglass fibers to get stuck in my skin. After going over everything with the sandpaper, I went over the whole thing with some kind of porous sanding pad that I have in my shop. It's kind of like steel wool, but not. Finally, after hours and hours of work, it's ready for paint. Except it wasn't. The Dremel left a bunch of tool marks that made it look terrible, and I ended up having to sand them out by hand. I just couldn't bring myself to record another one to two hour block of riveting footage of me sanding all the paint off. But I did it off camera, and now it's ready for paint. I chose this color of green because it's close to the colors that I used for the flower, but it's different enough to be its own distinct part of the plant. Next, I'm going to do what I'm probably worst at on any project, the airbrushing and final paint job. For those airbrushing masters out there, avert your eyes. I can weld, I can sculpt, I can do some simple wiring, I know how to make molds, but I am just not a painter. I don't know colors, and I don't know what things to shade, or how much detail to include or not include, or really even how to handle an airbrush correctly. When it comes to painting, I feel like I just don't get it. So, forgive me for my blunt force way of doing things. Painting is a skill that I'm still developing and trying to improve. That being said, as I've been talking, I've been painting all of the epoxy putty details a custom mixed yellowish green color. For all of the airbrushing that I do for this project, I use craft store paints that I mix up and water down in some little squeeze bottles. Since I finished painting everything with the first color, I move on to using a dark green color to add in some shadows to all of the segments. I also fade in the dark green around the top of the stem so that it will better blend in with the back of the flower.
Now that the first yellowish green color has dried, I'm going to go over all of those accents with a quick spray of UV reactive green paint. I'm only spraying enough paint so that it will be visible under a black light. It is, however, just barely visible in normal lighting. It gives the green color underneath a speckled look. Next, I'm going to spray some dark purple all around each one of the accents. I used this purple and the dark green on the flower as well. This way, there will be some connection color-wise between the two different parts of the prop. Sorry that the editing for this has been all over the place for this part of the video, but the jerk that was making this thing kept blocking my cameras. With the paint job pretty much done, it's time to glue the thorns to the stem. To do this, I need to drill out some holes that are the exact size of the thorns that I'll be using. These thorns are actually glow-in-the-dark pumpkin teeth that I bought from the dollar store. They weren't individual teeth, they were actually groups of teeth, so I had to cut off just the ones that I would need. Once I drilled the holes, I covered the bright white epoxy putty with some of the dark purple paint. I also used some clear silicone glue for this because I wasn't entirely sure that I'd like how they looked, so I wanted to be able to remove them without severely damaging anything. Next, I'm going to drill some holes in three different locations and glue in the big banana leaves that I showed from the beginning of the video. I placed two of them on either side so that they'd kind of look like arms, and the third leaf is positioned in a spot that will have it covering the bolt hole on the back of the stem. The holes are drilled out at a size that is just barely big enough for the leaves to fit. I then used a two-part epoxy glue to secure them into place. With the glue fully cured, the final step to finishing the stem is to airbrush the leaves with some of the dark purple and dark green paints that were used throughout the rest of the prop. This way, everything will feel more like one cohesive piece and not look like I just haphazardly stuck some leaves on either side of the stem. And with that, the stem is totally finished and ready to go. Next, I'm going to work on the potted plant base. As I was working on this project, I mixed up several different batches of the epoxy putty. Whenever I had leftover putty, I would use it to sculpt short vines and roots for the base. This way, none of my expensive sculpting putty would go to waste. A few of them had trouble holding their shape vertically, so I reinforced them with some bendable baling wire. After the putty fully cured, I coated them with primer and sprayed the roots brown and the vines green. Next, I cut four equal length pieces of PVC tube and a small strip of plywood. Then, I drilled two holes in the plywood that were just the right size for the pieces of PVC. I assembled them together, and then drilled two holes in the bottom of the pot that lined up with the PVC tubes. After shaping the ends of the PVC, I hot glued the four pieces of PVC into the bottom of the pot. With all of the PVC tubes glued into place, I taped up the holes in the bottom of the pot and started mixing up some concrete. I had to mix up a few batches, but I ended up filling up the pot with concrete all the way up to the top of the piece of wood. The reason that I filled this thing with concrete is because I wanted the end product to be very bottom heavy. 
which will hopefully prevent it from being easily knocked over and potentially damaged. After leaving the cement to cure outside in the sun for a couple of days, I traced out where I wanted to have the roots and vines attached. I then made cutouts around those spots to make it look as though the roots had burst out from the inside. Next, I use this massive screwdriver to chisel off and smooth out a somewhat flat space for where the stem will eventually sit. With everything prepped, I mix up a batch of epoxy glue and set all the roots and vines into place. When I glued the roots to the cement, I placed everything on this piece of melamine. That way it could be moved without anything being bumped out of place. As the epoxy glue was setting, I covered the top of the cement with this brown caulking and smoothed it out by hand. After the caulking on the top had set, I tipped it over and filled in the spaces around the roots. Next, I need to drill out some recesses on the bottom of the base, under the holes that connect with the pieces of PVC that are attached to the strip of wood. The reason that I'm doing this is because I need to make room for threads, washers, and bolt nuts. The way that the base and stem will attach together is with pieces of all thread and some bolt nuts. This way, when everything is assembled, it is very securely fastened together. Also, already in progress, I'm using the dark green paint to add shadows to the vines, as well as I mixed up a custom light brown color that I'm adding to the vines and roots as a highlight. This way, the vines will have a more dynamic coloring scheme consisting of shadows, midtones, and highlights. And with that, the potted plant base is finished. Now, it's finally time for me to start work on turning this craft store pumpkin into a man-eating, mean green mother from outer space who may or may not be mad. I start by marking out the general shape of the mouth and refining it until I like how it looks. I then use a box knife to cut out the shape of the mouth and cut the pumpkin into two halves. I cut the pumpkin in half because it will make it easier to detail the inside of the mouth. After checking the fit, I cut a wedge out of the back of the top half. Doing so will make more room for the teeth that I'll be using for this project. I also continue to refine the shape of the lips for the bottom half. With both halves looking good so far, I trace out the shape onto a piece of styrofoam and cut it out so that it will fit inside the pumpkin. I then cut it out to look like a horseshoe shape, and with the angle grinder disc, I rounded everything over. This piece of foam will be used to make the gums for the bottom half. I then cut out a thinner piece of foam to be the bottom of the inside of the mouth. Next, I cut out a piece of foam to be the tongue. Also, I realize that it looks vaguely inappropriate. I don't care. It's a tongue. Get over it. One of the reasons that I cut the pumpkin in half is so that I could have easy access to the inside of the mouth to add these kinds of details. If I had kept the pumpkin as one complete piece, it would have been much more difficult to make and sand everything that is inside of the mouth.
With the tongue fully sculpted, I patch up and smooth over any holes or gaps with some epoxy putty. Next I'll do a test fit to see how everything would look all together. After looking at it with the pot, the stem, and the two halves of the pumpkin all together, I decided that the mouth still needed to be wider apart. I also decided that the gray pot was too small, so I ended up getting a bigger one. To do this, I took the corner pieces that I cut off of the top of the pumpkin, and glued them to the back, and then cut them to fit the shape of the corners of the mouth. I don't really ever use hot glue as a permanent way or long-term solution for gluing something together. I'm using it here because it's a quick and simple way for these pieces to be held together until I can reinforce them with stronger materials later. With everything cut how I like it, it's finally time to move on to sculpting out the lips. Again, for this, I'm going to be using my epoxy sculpting putty. When sculpting the lips, I took extra care in making sure that the epoxy putty blended in seamlessly with the pumpkin. With half of the top half pretty much done, I move on to sculpting the bottom half of the pumpkin. The reason that I only sculpted half of the lips at a time is because after finishing one side, I didn't want to accidentally press the finished side down into the table, messing up what I had just completed. This way, I only have to worry about sculpting one side at a time without losing track of what was on the opposite side of what I was working on and messing up something that I had already finished. And with that, I let the epoxy putty cure overnight. The next day, I mixed up some more putty and got to work on sculpting the other half of the lips. When mixing the epoxy putty, I found that wetting my fingers before mixing makes it so that I don't have as much of it sticking to me and not mixing properly. After completing this stage of the lips, I used some extra putty to patch all of the seams around the back of the pumpkin. Now that the bottom half is done, I switch back over to working on the top half and try to do my best to get the two halves of the lips to look somewhat symmetrical. With the lips fully sculpted for both halves of the pumpkin, I set aside the top half and grabbed the bottom half to add some additional details. The original Audrey 2 puppet had some veiny, leaf-like detail towards the back of the flower. I'm not going to copy it exactly, but I do like that detail, and I want to put my own spin on it. I ended up making the veins on the bottom half of the flower a bit more intricate than the ones on the top half. This way, there would be a little bit more of a visual distinction between the two halves. Now that the epoxy putty is fully cured, it's time to smooth everything out with some sandpaper and make sure that everything is properly blended into the surface of the pumpkin. As I was sanding, I paid special attention to making sure that the two batches of sculpting putty blended together seamlessly and that I didn't have a weird crease going down the middle of the face.
Also, as I was sanding, I had to be careful that I didn't press too hard on the pumpkin and remove too much of the paint on the pumpkin. If too much of it was removed, it could potentially show up as a weird defect in the final hard coat. After I got everything sanded, I noticed that there were a few low spots and some bumpy bits in the first pass with the putty. So I mixed up a small batch and filled everything in. For those who don't know, epoxy putty can be smoothed out with plain old water. It's really easy stuff to work with once you get it all figured out. Next, I'm going to very quickly remake the gums for the bottom half. When I initially made them, I cut a curve on the bottom of them so that they would fit inside of the pumpkin. Unfortunately, when I cut the curve, I cut away too much material, so instead of trying to patch it, I just figured that I'd remake it instead. With the gums remade, I can hot glue them to the piece of foam that I cut to be the bottom of the mouth using the low setting on the hot glue gun. I then do a test fit to make sure that everything fits better and that there are no gaps. Everything seems to fit much better, so I'll go ahead and get this part finished up and then I'll get started on making the gums for the roof of the mouth. To make the gums for the roof of the mouth, I repeat the process that I did before, with the only difference being that I make sure that everything fits into the top of the mouth and not the bottom. It was difficult to gauge how much to trim down the piece of styrofoam that will eventually be the roof of the mouth. If I make it too shallow, the gums will stick out too much, and it will look funny. If I trim too much off, they'll disappear behind the lips, and I'll have put all this effort into something that won't be seen. So I had to keep adjusting it until I felt that I got it just right. When I was making the gums for this part, I intentionally made one side a bit bigger than the other. I did it this way because I didn't want it to be perfectly symmetrical all the way across. I wanted it to have some imperfections and a little bit of extra character. Now that the foam for the roof of the mouth is done, I can use some epoxy putty to sculpt some additional details into the hard palette. I designed it to look like the veins from the underside of a leaf. I mean, it is a plant after all. For anyone wondering why I would bother spending any amount of time adding a detail like this, my view on it is, if it could potentially be seen by someone looking at this thing, it should be made to be seen. To me, there's nothing worse than seeing unfinished elements on an amazing looking prop because you're not supposed to look at it from that angle. With everything sanded down, and I had a good chance to evaluate my work, I decided that I didn't like the look of the front of the lips. As I was examining the pictures of the Audrey II puppet, I noticed that the front of the mouth comes to a bit more of a rounded point, and the overall shape was a bit like the shape of an egg. Whereas the lips that I had sculpted had a bit more of a flat, Donald Duck bill look to them. So I mixed up a bit more putty and made corrections to the lips that would give it a bit more character. After giving the upper lip a bit more of a curl to it, I moved on to adjusting the lower lip to match.
Just as before, I took extra care to make sure that the epoxy putty that I was adding would blend seamlessly into the putty that was already there. After I left the putty to cure overnight, the next day I sanded everything down and made sure that everything blended together perfectly. With the top half sanded down and ready to go, I started finishing up the bottom half. Next, I'm going to cover everything with a few coats of onyx from Smooth On. I'm not sponsored by them, this is just what I'm using. Specifically, I'm using Fast Set Onyx, which cures very quickly. Don't get me wrong, that can be great when I want to get work done in a short period of time, but sometimes it starts curing in the cup before I can even brush it onto the prop that I'm working on. After I coated the outside of both halves of the pumpkin, I moved on to coating each of the other pieces of the inside of the mouth separately. About an hour later, after everything had plenty of time to fully cure, I sanded everything down as smooth as I could possibly make it. Just like with the stem, I'll be sanding and recoating a couple of times to get all of the bumps smoothed out. For some of those harder to reach spots, I found that the Dremel was the best way to smooth them out. I had to be careful though, and make sure that I didn't sand all the way through the onyx and mess up the sculpt of the epoxy putty, or the foam. Now that all of the pieces have been fully sanded, it's time to give everything another fresh coat of onyx. About another hour or so later, I go through all of the pieces again and sand them down nice and smooth. I know that this is a lot of repetitious work, but this is what it takes to get something that looks as nice as what this project's final result looks like. For any fiberglass sculpture in an amusement park of Mickey Mouse or Bugs Bunny or one of the princesses, this is how much work the person who made that statue put into it. Granted, they probably used a CNC machine or a 3D printer to do the bulk of the work, but the final finished smooth surface is likely still done by hand. As I've been editing this video, and looking at the shape of the two halves of the pumpkins, keeps reminding me of the ship from the movie The Flight of the Navigator. Obviously it doesn't look exactly like it, but it is giving me that vibe. It would be cool to make one as a prop replica. Hmm. I don't usually do this, but let me know in the comments if you actually sat down and watched this video all the way through. My guess is that most people will just watch the skit at the beginning and the reveal at the end of the video, and that's it. With all of the sanding done, it's time to embed the piece of wood that will serve as the point where the flower will bolt to the stem, as well as the support that will hold the two halves of the pumpkin together. I cut out a round piece of plywood and drilled a recessed hole in it that I can embed another tea nut. Then, just like the piece of wood that I embedded in the bottom of the stem, I glue a cap over the T-nut. Once the glue has dried, I drill a corresponding hole into the back of the bottom half of the pumpkin and bolt the piece of wood into place. I then use some expansion foam to glue everything together. After the expansion foam has set, I trim off all of the excess bits and start working on getting the bottom of the inside of the mouth to fit with the piece of wood that's now in place.
It took a bit of adjusting, but I eventually got it to fit just right. To glue the two pieces together, you guessed it, more expansion foam. With the foam fully cured, I clean off all of the foam squeeze out and get everything sanded down smooth and prepped to be fully bonded together with another coat of onyx. Oh yeah, I uh, also used onyx to glue the tongue in. I'll switch over to working on the top half and give it a second coat of onyx. Now while that's setting, I'll switch back to the bottom half and sand everything down nice and smooth. I then poured some onyx on the wood in the back of the mouth to seal it as well as to seal the edges of the tongue and gums. Next, I went back to sanding the outside of the top half. I do promise that this is the last time that you have to see me fully sand this thing. Just like for the bottom half, I glued the roof of the mouth in with a batch of expansion foam. Once the foam has fully cured, I clean off all of the foam squeeze out and get everything sanded down smooth and prepped to be fully bonded together with another coat of onyx. After checking the fit with the gums glued into place, I decided that the mouth needed to be just a little bit more open, so I cut a little bit more of a wedge off of the back of the top half. I also used my Dremel to clear out a space for the joining board to fit in the back of the top half. About an hour or so later, the onyx was fully set, and I got to work on sanding everything down and getting it prepped for paint. Before I glued the two halves together, I decided that painting them separately would be much easier than trying to evenly paint everything in the small cramped space of the inside of the mouth after it's glued together. I first coated everything with a solid coat of primer. Once that dried, I then gave everything two coats of a glossy purple. With everything painted, I moved on to figuring out where the teeth would go. I was suggested to use these teeth from another video that used these exact same ones. They're very good quality and I do recommend them. Even though I don't show it in this video, I did periodically check to see if the teeth would intersect with one another while I was figuring out where they should go. After I got all of the teeth figured out, I took them out and got ready to do some airbrushing. This footage, right here, is actual footage of me learning how to use an airbrush for the very first time. I had purchased this airbrush equipment about 10 or so years ago, but I could never get it to work right for me. I'm going to guess that I was just putting the wrong kind of paint through it, because it would just immediately get clogged up. But this time I cleaned them real good and I used some fresh tubes of craft store paint and it finally worked. Which is really good because there was no possible way that I could have ever finished this project if I couldn't airbrush it. Now that I have the airbrushing done and the teeth figured out, I can finally glue these two halves together. And of course, I use some expansion foam. After the foam had fully set, I scraped and cleared away any excess foam that had squeezed out. Next, I mixed up another batch of putty and patched up everything on the back where the two halves met up.
With all of the patchwork done, it's time to make the male connector that will fit with the female connector that's on the stem. I started by cutting out a round piece of plywood, and then I used a Forstner drill bit to make a notch in it. This notch will make it so that the flower can only be attached facing one way. I then cut out another round piece of plywood and glued the two together. Once the glue dried, I used some expansion foam to glue it to the back of the flower. I also threaded a bolt through the T-nut to make sure that everything would line up perfectly. After the foam had set, I chiseled off any excess bits and cleaned everything off with some sandpaper and the Dremel. I then used a bit more putty to smooth out the gap between the plywood and the foam pumpkin. Once the putty had fully cured, I smoothed it out and blended the edges in with some sandpaper. With all the edges of the putty blending in seamlessly, I coated everything with two coats of onyx. I included a patch of fiberglass cloth with the first coat on both sides just to add a little bit of extra support. While I gave the onyx a bit of time to cure, and before I started sanding it, I poured some clear epoxy resin into the back of the mouth to cover any areas where the foam might be open to the air, and also to cover the little bits of foam that I couldn't scrape off from when I glued the two halves together. With the first coat all smoothed out, I mix up one last batch and brush it over the back of the flower. After the onyx had fully cured, I sand down the hard coat for the last time and get everything prepped for paint. Part of the paint prep is protecting all of the paint that's already finished that's inside the mouth, so I very carefully cover everything with some blue painter's tape. Now that the painter's tape is all done, I can finally start painting this thing. And I of course start with a solid coat of primer. Of course, to get the oh so smooth finish, I completely sand off the first coat of primer just like I did with the stem. This leaves paint in all of the low spots, while all of the high spots get sanded down. Now that I'm done sanding, I coat the entire thing with two coats of primer. Next, I sprayed the entire thing with a satin green color that's called Eden. Once the green has dried, I spray this yellow color on and around the lips. I also alternate with the green color to get the amount of yellow that I'm looking for, with just the right amount of gradient leading into it. After I got the yellow and green just how I wanted it, I got to work on the final home stretch of adding the airbrush detail paint job. I of course took inspiration from the paint job on the Audrey 2 Puppet, but I added my own flavor for how I wanted it to look. Also, there is no way in hell that I would even know where to begin on trying to replicate what they did. It also doesn't help much that this footage is literally my second time ever using my airbrush. So I'm going to count this as a small miracle that this thing turned out the way that it did.
Well, one side turned out halfway decent. Let's see if lightning can strike twice. Sweet. I got the dark green tiger stripes all done, now I'm going to start painting the lips. After studying the reference photos, I chose to paint them this light pink color. Every bit of artwork that I see of Audrey 2, the artist puts these big red fire engine lips on it. I mean, sure, yeah, they have red in them, but they're not like, lipstick red. Next, I'm going to use a paintbrush to hand paint some lines onto the lips with three different colors. I did this to replicate the lines that are naturally in lips, and flowers have this kind of stuff, right? Like, I've seen it before on something. Next, I flip it over and work on painting the other lip. The next color for the lip lines is a darker pink color. The last color for the lip lines is a light tan color. I really feel like using the three different colors was just the right number and it gave it a really good look. With the lip lines done, I move on to painting the veins with the same UV reactive green paint that I used on the stem. I started by trying to brush it on, but it was looking terrible. Then I tried to smooth it out with the airbrush, but that wasn't working either. I mean, it really wasn't working the way that I wanted it to. so I finally decided to mask off the veins and paint them that way. Initially, I was really trying to avoid doing it this way because it would be a bit more labor intensive, but in the long run, it ended up making it much easier and more controlled when painting the UV paint. With the first side taped up, I can give it a test run to see how well it works out. And as it turns out, it's really quick and easy to do the airbrushing this way. Now that the UV green is painted on both veins on the bottom lip, I'll give it a bit of time to dry and I'll get to work on taping up the top half. Before I flipped it over, I taped it up completely in order to protect the UV paint. I could very easily end up scratching the fresh paint while I was working on the other half of it. After a few hours, the paint had fully dried and I could remove the tape. Next, I loaded up the dark purple paint that I used on the stem, and I carefully airbrushed a line, or a shadow, or shading, whatever you want to call it, all the way around each one of the veins. Basically, the goal was to soften the hard edge that was left behind from using the painter's tape. I also used the dark purple to add a bunch of spots everywhere. I 
I know that the Audrey 2 puppet didn't have any spots like this, but I really do like how these spots complement the more simplistic paint job that I'm doing. Also, I went over all of the dark purple spots with UV reactive purple paint. And with that, one side is finished and ready to be sealed with clear coat. Once the clear coat dried, I taped it up so I could flip it over to work on the other side. So, as I was checking out how vibrant the fluorescent paint would be, I realized that there was a problem with what I had been doing. Apparently, there's a huge amount of overspray coming off of the airbrush, and it was getting on everything that wasn't covered by tape. At first, I tried to see if I could lightly sand it off without disturbing the other detail paint, but unfortunately, it was removing everything to make it go away. So basically, I had to repaint the entire thing, starting with the green Eden spray paint all the way back to the airbrushing stage that I had just shown. Unfortunately, during the repaint process, I forgot to pick up and continue recording where I had stopped, and I skipped recording a little bit of the airbrushing that I did. But this video is long enough at this point, so I'm sure that you all will forgive me on this one. Also, if the paint job looks a little darker than it did, or a little muddier, having to do a complete repaint of the entire thing is why. Now that everything is caught back up to before where I realized that I had screwed up, I used the dark pink paint that I used for the lines on the lips, and airbrushed just a bit of the inside edge of the lips where the gums and lips meet. Okay, this time it's for really reals. I seal everything in with clear coat, and I can finally move on to the next step. It's finally time to remove the tape and work on getting the teeth painted and ready to be glued in. However, before I glued the teeth in, I used the dark purple paint to airbrush the clear epoxy that I poured into the back of the mouth. I then used the purple paint to soften the color change between the gums and the lips. When I finished painting the line between the gums and the lips with the purple, I'll have completely finished painting the flower. Finally. To prep the teeth for paint, I coated all of them with a primer that bonds with plastic. Once that dried, I then brushed and airbrushed on a very pale yellowish white color. Next, I covered the bottom half of the teeth with a dirty yellow color. And finally, I painted the very bottom of the teeth with a darker version of the dirty yellow paint. Now that the teeth are fully painted, I can start gluing them into place. When I did the test fit for the teeth all of those centuries ago, I took a few pictures of their placement so I'd be able to put the two different sizes of teeth back in the same spot as before. These are those pictures. And there they go. I haven't checked this yet, but I think that the glue that I use can dissolve styrofoam. I didn't check before I used it, and I'm afraid to damage it to see if the foam was dissolved away underneath the onyx. As far as I'm concerned, they're not falling out at the moment, so it's not a problem. Alrighty, the pot is done, the stem is done, the flower is fully painted, now it's time to work on all the additional decorations that will make this thing really pop. First, I'm going to take a bunch of these leaves and airbrush them with some UV reactive green and purple paint. Once 
Well, I have plenty of green ones at this point. Time to work on some purple ones. With all of the leaves painted, I move on to gluing them to the back of the flower. To do this, I'll be using some two-part epoxy glue. To glue them down, I spread the glue on the bottom third of the leaf and securely tape it to the back of the flower. I specifically placed them like this because the leaves would be sandwiched between the stem and the flower. This way, the leaves will somewhat obscure the seam between the stem and the flower. I ended up doing four layers of leaves. The first layer was mostly the ones with the green paint, while the last layer was mostly the ones with the purple paint. I started off by taping them down with a blue painter's tape because I was concerned that a stronger tape might peel the paint off. As I added more layers, the painter's tape wasn't quite working out so well, so I switched over to standard duct tape. Fortunately, it wasn't strong enough to peel the paint off either. To glue down the next couple layers of leaves, I had to grind down the plastic bits from the first few layers of leaves. For this last layer, I just focused on filling in any open spots or gaps. With all of the leaves glued into place, I grind down all of the plastic bits and make everything as smooth as possible. Then, using the dark green paint, I airbrush all of the leaves so that the stem and flower will blend together better. And with that, the flower is finished, ready for the reveal. But first, I got one last detail to work on. I picked these little guys up at the craft store, and I'm going to give them a little bit of a glow up to match the paint job of the big one. So I'll get to work on that, and I'll check back in with everyone at the reveal. And there it is. About 70 hours of work, around three weeks of editing, with 1.6 terabytes of footage to sift through, and this is my end result. Personally, I'm amazed that I was capable of finishing this project. I genuinely started this having absolutely no idea how I was going to pull off the paint job. Building it? Yeah, sure. Fine, I know how to do that. But painting? Yeah. I don't know what I was thinking. Considering that I've been talking about this thing for the past hour and seven minutes or so, I don't know what else I could say. I do want to say, though, that I'm not going to get in the habit of making movie props or that sort of thing. I plan on sticking to my own projects or stuff that isn't copyrighted. Also, I want to add that I did get a lot of tips for how to approach building this project from another video. So if some of the techniques that I use seem similar, I got them from their video. This whole thing was a bit of an exercise to take the prop that they made and do my own version of it with my style. For this next bit of explaining what my style is, I don't mean it as throwing shade or insulting anybody or putting anyone down to lift myself up. I mean it purely as clarifying the differences between myself and others. Personally, I wanted to make one of these where there was no seams between the lips and the pumpkin, and I wanted to use materials that were a bit more durable. 
Essentially, my style is to make an end product that could potentially be found in an amusement park. Because look at the other videos on my channel, amusement parks are what I'm about. So check them out, they have a lot of good information in their video as well. With that, I hope that somebody watches this way too long video, and I'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching. 